Good morning. Good morning. I'm glad to be with you folks this morning. I'm sure you feel the same way. Hey? Oh, yeah. Hey, man. <laughs> oh, great. Well, what a wonderful day. I don't know about the weather outside, but nonetheless, uh, the warmth of the Lord is here, and I can see the, the glow in your faces. And, uh, it's a great opportunity for us to be together as God's children uh, to share to share what the Lord is doing in our lives in that time of prayer and what Warren said, thanking, uh, thanking the body, the body of believers for their prayers united together. There's, there's one body, one God, one King, and uh, to be united together and praying uh, for one another and, and caring for each other. And that's just a real, a real strong... Uh, Testimony of the unity in Christ that we have. So, uh, welcome as well, those who are here for the first time. We're glad to have you with us and, uh, and to uh, worship with us as well. Welcome back, uh, Jack. You made it back yesterday? Yes. Was it raining yesterday? Yes. Yes, it was, eh? I was following the weather. I went on the satellite image and I could see you were, it was a bit north and west of us, but you were traveling that way. Yeah. I was wondering. So we're glad you made it back safely. And how's your father doing? Um, he's, he's improving slowly, yes. Okay. So it's good. Okay. Good news. Let's continue to pray for your dad as well. Let me just share a few co quotes. Uh, as an introduction, I use warm. Someone has said this way, if the church is a living body united to the same head, governed by the same laws and pervaded by the same spirit, it is impossible that one part should be independent of all the rest. What binds us together is not common education, common race, common income levels, common politics, common nationality, common accents, common jobs, or anything else of that sort. Christians come together because they have all been loved and forgiven by Jesus himself. Be united with others, said Corey Ten Boom. A wall with loose bricks is not good. The, the bricks must be cemented together. Kind of reminds me of a song, Bind Us Together. 8T Pearson says this, there has never been a spiritual awakening in any country or locality that did not begin in united prayer. By a matchless parable, our Lord taught us that all believers are branches of the living vine and that apart from Him, we are nothing and can do nothing because we have in us no life. Thomas Watson said, There is but one God, and they that serve him should be one. There is nothing that would render the true religion more lovely or make more proselytes to it than to see the professors of it tied together with the heartstrings of love. If God be one, let all that profess him be of one mind and of one heart, and thus fulfill Christ's prayer when he said that they all may be one. The importance of unity. Someone has said, said church goers are like coals and fire. When they cling together, they keep the flame aglow. When they separate, they die out. You've heard this said before, united we stand, divided we fall. Jesus said no one can serve two masters. He also said if a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. A threefold cord is not quickly broken, wrote Solomon in the book of Ecclesiastes. Psalm 133 says, Behold how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Benjamin Franklin said, we must all hang together, 
or we shall all hang separately. <laughs> Someone else has said, weak things become strong when united. And there's a Yiddish proverb that says, if a link is broken, the whole chain breaks. In my introduction, you can kind of see where we're going. The importance of unity and the consequences of disunity, division and strife. Factions always breed fractions. Division always leads to destruction if it's not dealt with. Kaboom! Goes the nation. Or I should say kaboom! Goes the nation. And so that's what occurred as we read through 1 Kings chapter 12. If you have your Bibles, turn with me again. And thank you for reading that passage of Scripture. From 1 Kings, or not Eddie, but Mrs. Finn. Yes, okay. ask Mrs. Finn. And thank you, Mrs. Finn, for reading that passage of Scripture. From taken from 1 Kings chapter 12. And in this, in this chapter is recorded one of the, one of the most uh, difficult passages of Scripture to, to read as it relates to the nation of Israel. Up until now, the nation, the nation of Israel is one, united. Let's see, we do have some maps here. There's the uh, first nation, or that's the nation from its inception. I don't know if it can be any clearer than that. It's not very clear. From its in inception, now oh, I got my glasses on, it's a little clearer. <laughs> we see that the, when Joshua brought the, the nation of Israel across, and they dwelt there at Gilgal. And there all of the tribes were to spread out, 12 tribes, and to um, take the land known as Israel. That was to be theirs. It was promised by God to be blessed by God if they would obey Him. And there we see all of the different houses to be divided up in all these parcels of land. Some were actually on the east of the Jordan River. I was just talking to Lori Barr. Uh, today, a little bit, because she just got back from Israel, and uh, she was uh, really excited about her trip and all the different places that she visited in uh, Israel and Jerusalem, and she was at the Wailing Wall and all of that. But uh, this is uh, 1,400 years, over 1,400 years B.C. The nation of Israel was born and occupied by uh, the Israelites. And the, the land was uh, divided up and parceled out according to the tribes. And there we see it as one nation. Right there. One, one nation blessed by God, Jerusalem, under David who moved, uh, well, not uh, Solomon who brought the temple to, built the temple, and the ark was brought to Jerusalem. And there... Uh, there began a great, uh, a great time of uh, Israel enjoying being blessed by God up until approximately 931 B.C. Maybe as late as 921 B.C. That's where chapter uh, 12 of 1 Kings uh, begins. Approximately at that time, something happened that we're going to read about. The nation became divided. If you see the broken line in the middle, that it became two nations with two kings. One to the north, Israel. One to the south, called Judah. Because of what happened here in 1 Kings chapter 12. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me. To chapter 12, 1 Kings, and we'll begin reading in verse 1. Well, the last verse of chapter 11 says this, Then Solomon rested with his fathers, and was buried in the city of David his father, and Rehoboam his 
son reigned in his place. There's going to be two kabones that just destroy this nation and rip it apart. But there's going to remember history of the Bible is written for us today so that we can extract practical lessons from it. It's not just history for you and I, but there's lessons to be learned as God's people. And what lessons can we learn? Well, there's some exciting things that we can learn and some sobering things that we could be reminded of. Unity. It's all about unity, this chapter, or disunity. And factions that lead to <laughs> fractions, fractures. And Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel had gone to Shechem to make him king. Rehoboam went to Shechem. He's now going to be the ordained king. This was a logical continuation of the Davidic dynasty, David's, uh, David's grandson. David was succeeded by his son Solomon, and now Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, was assumed to be the next king. The coronation was taking place. It's interesting to note that Rehoboam was the only son of Solomon that we know by name. He had, it says, 700 wives and 300 concubines, yet we read of one son he had to bear up his name, and he was a fool of a son. This demonstrates that wrong decisions always have bad consequences. Shechem, it says, not in, not in Jerusalem, but in Shechem, a little north, in the, what would be the northern kingdom, Israel. But it's a city rich in history. Abraham worshipped there. Jacob built an altar and purchased land there. Joseph was buried there. It was also the geographical center, center of the northern tribes. All in all, it showed that Rehoboam was in a position of weakness having to meet the ten northern tribes on their territory instead of demanding that representatives come to Jerusalem. Now look what happens here. So it happened when Jeroboam, in verse 2, the son of Nebat heard it. Remember, he was still in Egypt because he had fled to Egypt when Solomon heard that Jeroboam was going to be the king. Jeroboam was at one time had a special place in Solomon's uh, in Solomon's administration, but he had to flee to Egypt, and then after Solomon died, he came back onto the scene, and the whole assembly of Israel came and spoke to Rehoboam, saying, "Your father made uh, this is the first request made to uh, Rehoboam the king. Remember, there's two kabones that happened." Jeroboam and Rehoboam. And these two kings of these two divided nations just bring destruction, not only on themselves, but on the people and upon the nation itself. It says, Your father, referring to Solomon, made our yoke heavy. Now, therefore, lighten the burdensome service of your father and his heavy yoke, which he put on us, and we will serve you. So he said to them, depart for three days, and then come back to me. And the people departed. So he needed time to think about this request. Make our burden lighter. Your father made it so difficult for us. And for uh, the reason that Solomon was really into building things. The temple, the palace, and all of these places. And by the end he was building all of these idols all over the place. Solomon was a great king, but he took a lot from the people. The people of Israel wanted relief from the heavy taxation and poor, servant, poor service of Solomon's reign. And they offered an allegiance to Rehoboam if he agreed to it. Well, there we have uh, an introduction to Rehoboam's reign. Sadly, they made no spiritual demands, did they? It was just about physical, about financial, about workload. So Rehoboam said, give me three days and I'll think about it. 
Just a side note, three in the Bible is the number of completeness. So in other words, three days would be enough. It's interesting if you go back a few years in 1945, remember the bombing on Japan of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And in, on, eight, on August 6th, they were, the, the Japanese were forewarned the emperor that they needed to uh, give up or else they were going to suffer catastrophic ends. And they didn't listen, and that first uh, atomic bomb fell on Hiroshima. They were given three days, and if they didn't uh, give up, they were going to be bombed again. And the king, the emperor, had three days to think about it. The Japanese emperor, and they they didn't uh, they didn't believe that they had another bomb. And sure enough, they bombed again Nagasaki, and that was the end. It led to destruction. Two kabooms there, but there was a time to think about it. And they didn't take the right advice. You see, going even further back, we see that there's three days um, Rehoboam has to think about the offer that's being presented by Jeroboam, who's representing the people who's come back onto the scene. So what does he do? He seeks out counsel. Wise decision. At least the first step is wise. So he talks to the elders. These would be those that work in the administration of his father, Solomon. And they give him wise counsel, good counsel. And they say to him, um, they spoke to him saying, If you will be a servant to these people today, and serve them, and answer them, and speak good to them, or speak good words to them, then they will be your servants forever. Oh, great advice with great results because of the great results, shall I say. Isn't that what Rehoboam wants? A united kingdom? No. Or it doesn't appear that way, does it? He rejected the advice before he even went somewhere else. He rejected that advice. The elders had given him and consulted the young man who had grown up with him, who stood before him. He sought out his buds, his, uh, the, the group and the gang that he grew up with. Now remember, Rehoboam is the son of the king, so they're not running with the regular crowd, the common folk. He probably, his friends, are of the same uh, mindset, the same experience in life, that they've had everything given to them on a silver platter. The noble types. So he sees them, and they give him, they give him advice as well, but the opposite to what the uh, wise elders did. And the counsel from Rehoboam's younger advisors, he remember, he rejected the wise counsel before he really even listened to it. The, the other council. And the other one said, Are you kidding me? You're not going to do this for the people. What advice do you give? How should we answer this people who have spoken to me saying in verse 9, lighten the yoke which your fathers put on us. Then the young men who were growing up with him told him saying, thus you should speak to this people who have spoken to you saying, your fathers made our yoke heavy, but you make it lighter on us. Thus you shall say to them, My little finger shall be thicker than my father's waist. And now whereas my father put a heavy yoke on you, I will add to your yoke. My father chastised you with whips, which is a leather strip, but I will chastise you with scourges. That's even little pieces of bone embedded in the, the leather whip. That's even far worse. So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam the third day as the king had directed, saying, Come back to me the third day. And the king answered the people roughly and rejected the advice which the elders had given, given him. And he spoke to them in verse 14 according to the advice of the young men, saying, My father made your yoke heavy, but I will add to your yoke. My father chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scourges. You see, his approach... Rehoboam's approach was the exact opposite to what he should have done. Rehoboam caused a big explosion and just 
ripped apart the potential and the possibil possibility of reconciliation because of his selfish desires. But you see, his problem was in his relationships with people. Jeroboam, we're going to read in the second half of the chapter, his problem was in his religion, his relationship with God. But between the two of them, their relationships were wrong. And when there's a wrong relationship with the Lord, and when there's a wrong relationship with people, I guarantee you, it leads to division. It leads to problems. What lessons can we learn, though, from the two kabooms? Relationship issues. How to work with people. That's the message we need to glean from Rehoboam and from his life and his actions and behavior. The one thing I don't read about Rehoboam in this whole process, though I said primarily it's a relationship with people, and we'll get to that. The one thing I don't read about in Rehoboam's life is that, and it's a glaring omission, is the is the fact that there is no no mention of prayer. There's no mention of prayer. He is the king. He's assumed the most important, responsible position in all of the land of Israel. And as the king, he had the responsibility first and foremost to God, to Jehovah God. We read about his grandfather. What did his grandfather pray? Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the path that is everlasting. What about the prayer of his father, Solomon, where in 1 Kings chapter 3, we read in verse 9, where he said, praying to God, beseeching God, saying, give your servant an understanding heart. We don't read of any of that. In Rehoboam. It's, it's good to seek counsel. But it's important to seek counsel from the wonderful counselor. The mighty God. And how God provides. And how God blesses. And how God answers the requests. It may not be at that specific moment. But in these crucial times. We need to be in prayer when decisions have to be made. Maintaining unity. Second lesson that we can learn from Rehoboam and what he didn't do. Seek wise counsel. Rehoboam received wise counsel from the elders of Israel but chose the counsel of his buddies instead. It has been said that this is a common uh, phenomenon today. What some call advice shopping. The idea is that you keep asking different people for advice until you find someone who will tell you what you want to hear. This is unwise and ungodly way to get counsel. It is better to have a few trusted friends and counselors who will listen to even tell you, listen to you, and even tell you what you don't necessarily want to hear, but what you need to hear. The young men who were growing up with him. These men were much more likely to tell Rehoboam what he already thought. He just wanted to find them out. He probably knew what they were going to say. When they said, put a double burden on the people. Their unwise advice shows the wisdom of seeking counsel from those outside our immediate situation and context. You see, sometimes we find people that are so, so closely connected to us and related to our situation and empathizing so much with us that they're going to tell us what we want to hear. Sometimes it's good to take a step back and see someone who's looking at the bigger picture outside of your bubble that can give you better advice. That where you're just seeking the counsel, the right counsel, for the right reasons. 
Mark Twain once said, when I was a boy of 14, my father was so ignorant, I could hardly stand to have the old man around. But when I got to be 21, I was astonished by how much he had learned in seven years. <laughs> Solomon said, listen, my son, to your father's instruction, and do not forsake your mother's teachings in Proverbs chapter 1. Value mentors. Seek wise experience and counsel. Follow godly caring advice. Not the advice we want to hear, but the advice we need to hear. That's such an important lesson that we can take to heart and implement into our lives to grow, where we see the potential for division. We need to hear someone outside of our bubble who will tell us what we need to hear. Someone who will help us get through life's journeys, not simply sweeping all of our issues and problems under the carpet or dealing them in a way that, causes, that just puts a bigger burden on the situation as Solomon wanted to do. Just weigh the people down. I'm so thankful for our Lord who said, All ye who are weary and heavy laden, come to me, for I am meek and lowly of soul, and you shall and lowly of heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. That's the Jesus that we love. That's the Jesus that we serve. He doesn't place a burden on us to weigh us down, but he frees us from our burdens. Because he has reconciled us to himself. And so we can bring about reconciliation by not weighing down people with burdens and suppressing and hurting them, but to help them. Third lesson, if we want to bring about not division and strife, but if we, we, we choose to bring about healing, Choose the path of service. Look what verse 7 says. The wise, these wise counselors, and they spoke to him saying, if you will be a servant to these people today and serve them. Serve the people today and they will serve you forever. Rehoboam was being given a chance to right the, right the wrong that his father had put a real burden on the people because of his building projects so much that these people wanted to serve Solomon and they saw his vision and they saw his passion and things were getting done but there was a time when there needed to be a change of direction. Rehoboam in his wisdom should have seen it that way. And he should have followed the advice and sought to serve these people instead of asking from them, saying, I'm going to serve you. Let us consider the author and finisher of our faith who said, he came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for the many. When we think of our relationship in our home, our workplace, our neighborhood, let us consider how we can lighten the load of those around us and not weigh people down with more burdens. Have you ever read the book How to Win Friends and Influence People? Dale Carnegie. Dale Carnegie, that's right. And that was originally published in 1936. He sold over 15 million copies. The book had six major sections in how to handle people. The first section is, fun, is a fundamental technique in handling people. I'm wondering if Dale Carnegie got some of his, because this is really how to, um, how to handle people. This is taken uh, right from here in 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 7. Be a servant to them, serve them, answer them, speak good words to them, and they will be your servants forever. Yes? Yes, I want to tell you that to, even today, there are Dale Carnegie courses of help all over the world. All right. How, and how to deal with people. All right. Okay. That's good to know. Thank you. 
And uh, as well, this is a great book to learn how to deal with people. And as I was saying, Carnegie may have got some of the, the principles are right here. Because he said in his book, don't criticize, condemn, or complain. That's the first lesson that he shared in his first section on fundamental techniques in handling people. Secondly, give honest and sincere appreciation. Strike two against Rayable. And thirdly, arouse in other people a desire to want to be involved. Strike three. Rehoboam went against the advice of these elders. He took his, the advice of those who had no clue of what was going on. And in his relationships, he caused division right there. Boom. So that when he went up to the place where he was ordained king, and this is the message that he gave them, what happened. On top of that, he sent his tax collector up there to start collecting some money. And what did they do to him? The king Rehoboam, in verse 18, it says, the king Rehoboam sent Adoram, who was in charge of the revenue. But all Israel stoned him with stones, and he died. Therefore, king Rehoboam mounted his chariot in haste to flee to Jerusalem. If he didn't believe the people before in what they were saying, he believed in that. And so he learned a lesson. That's his, his problem, his responsibility, and his cause of the fracture. But he's only half of the Kabom. The other Kabom is named Jeroboam. And he causes problems too. But his is in his relationship with God. See, he, he says, well, we're going to split the nation up. Israel's to the north. And we're going to go to the north. But I don't want the people going back to the south. That's going to be referred to Judah from this day forward. To worship at the temple. Because they may enjoy the temple and they'll meet the people again. And what will happen in time is I'll lose my people. And I'll lose my kingdom. As, it, as uh, is stated in these passages of scripture. Look at verse 27. Or 26, and Jeroboam said in his heart, now the kingdom may return to the house of David. If these people go up to offer sacrifices in the house of the Lord in Jerusalem, then the heart of this people will turn back to their Lord, Rehoboam, king of Judah. And they will kill me and go back to Rehoboam, king of Judah. The second kaboom here. The second kaboom is just as bad, if not worse, than the first kaboom. The lessons we can draw from Rehoboam's actions. Relationship issues, how to work with people, well, that's the first one. The second one is Jer Jeroboam and lessons. This we can learn from religious issues, how to worship God. The folly, number one lesson is the folly and sin of seeking to help God to fulfill His promises by our efforts at making their fulfillment sure. You see, Jeroboam had the conditions for safety and stability clearly laid out. In the previous chapter, in verse 38, God says to him, Then it shall be, if you, if you heed all that I command you, walk in my ways and do what is right in my sight, to keep my statutes and my commandments as my servant David did, then I will be with you and build for you an enduring house as I built for David and will give Israel to you. God says that he will bless Jeroboam as king of the northern kingdom if he will do all that God asks him to do. So there was no need for building places like Shechem and Peniel Two places where they would worship. And he would make and they would make calves, golden calves. And instead of going to the temple where God was, the presence of God, these people were to worship at other places and worship calves. You see, it takes faith to trust God. Simple and clear, his simple and clear word. We'll, and we feel safer though. If we can trust him 
on our own terms and not his. See, his, his disobedience was that he wanted the people to worship God, but on his terms, because he was fearful of two things. Number one, he was fearful of his own life. Number two, he was fearful of his subjects. He was fearful of those that he wanted to keep to himself. So on those two issues, he ended up disobeying God. And we can be reminded and encouraged. We don't need to fear our lives as God's people, as God's children. Nor do we need to preoccupy ourselves with those around us to the point that we would disobey God rather than doing what's right. As we think of um, all those that we're responsible to, the best thing that we can do is commit them to the Lord and live a life that is pleasing in God's sight as a testimony. And not worry so much and be filled with fears about our own personal safety and what is going around with the people, maybe even nearest and dearest to us. Prayer should replace pride and fear. Not only that, he turned to false worship as a mere instrument for securing personal ends. He was willing to take the people away from the true worship of God to protect himself. Alexander Leclerc states, Jeroboam has had many followers among politicians. The average statesman looks at on all religions as equally true or untrue and is ready to be polite to any of them so long as they support him or her. And we see that every political season, don't we? The priests of Bethel in the northern kingdom who were selected by Jeroboam, remember the priesthood had to be from the line of Aaron, a Levite. But Jeroboam said, no, no, we can't have that. We need to find our own priests. We'll do things our own way. And he just selected priests. Look at verse 31. He made shrines on the high places and made priests from every class of people. That's wrong. There's a piece supposed to be from the tribe of Levi. Levites. Who were not of the sons of Levi. The priests of Bethel who were selected by Jeroboam were not likely to at any time be his rebukers. This is a true example of the state influencing the church for its own end and personal benefit. And that's why it's so important. As a body of believers, we are distinguished and separate from the government. And that we don't have the government dictate to us what we will and will not do. We will stand on God's word and his word alone. When Amos the prophet spoke bold words against the king, remember, it was Amaziah, the priest of the, in the northern kingdom, gave a shameful counsel, O thou seer, flee into the land of Judah and prophesy there. But prophesy no more at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary. The priest rejecting the prophet who was speaking the truth because the priest was too closely connected with the king in the northern kingdom. Once the kingdoms were split up and divided, 20 kings reigned over the nation of Israel and not one of them worshipped God. Jeroboam is another one of these cases where we say, oh, he had such great potential. You know? Whatever that word means. The potential was that the promises of God. That God said, I will bless you if you obey my commands. And he squandered that opportunity and it led to destruction. Jeroboam's policy may have been a great success. It united his kingdom and, separated from and was separated from Judah. But it was purchased at the price of spiritual erosion. The priests were nothing more than political pawns that 
cherubim used to get his way. And finally, in the lessons of Jeroboam and the spiritual, in our relationship with God, remember, Jesus said that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father but by me. People try to replace the true worship of God with another type of worship. And the true nature of idolatry is brought out in this incident here in chapter 12. You see, Jeroboam did not draw Israel away to worship other gods in his initial reason and purpose. It doesn't say that. There's no charge made against the calf worship. Even though, remember where he was before in Egypt? We go back to Exodus chapter 32 when Moses is on the mountain and the Israelites below make this golden calf and they're worshiping it. Did you see? Um, it was meant to be a system of worshiping Jehovah. But even though the single motive stated in the, the text is policy inspired by fear, jo Jehovah did not care enough about the worship and proper approach to the true God. Therefore, he had graven images built, which would lead the northern nation on a downward <coughs> spiral of spiritual erosion called idolatry. Jeroboam, in this lesson, may stand as a type of man and woman who suppose themselves to be worshipping God when they are only following their own wills and their own desires. And may we be reminded of that. What did Jeroboam win? Where there was so much potential and promise, a troubled reign, and destruction of his house after one generation. One more thing he won. Namely, that terrible epitaph where it says, Jeroboam, the son of Nebal, who made Israel sin. What a title to be branded on a man. Let us be reminded that the only safe motto for changes, for churches, and individuals alike, in all the details of worship in life, is to identify with the words of the psalmist. Lo, I come to do thy will, O Lord, and thy law is written in my heart. Let me share this story in conclusion. During World War II, Hitler commanded all religious groups to unite so that he could control them. <coughs> Among the brethren assemblies, half complied and half refused. Those who went along with the order had a much easier time. Those who did not face harsh persecutions in almost every family of those who resisted. Someone died in a concentration camp. When the war was over, feelings of bitterness ran deep between the groups, and there was so much tension, division, and strife. Finally, they decided that the situation had to be healed. Leaders from each group met at a quiet retreat. For several days, each person spent time in prayer, examining his own heart in the light of Christ's command. Then they came together, Francis Schaeffer, who told of the incident, asked a friend who was there, what did you do then? We were just one, he replied, as they confessed their hostility and bitterness to God and yielded to his control, the Holy Spirit created a spirit of unity among them. Love filled their hearts and dissolved their hatred. When love prevails among believers, especially in times of strong disagreement, it presents to the world an indisputable mark of true followers in Jesus Christ. And so, as we consider this chapter and all that transpired with the grave consequences because of division and strife, that the nation was fractured and has never been brought back together as God intended it to be, when we look at the first and second pictures. That can happen in our churches 
That can happen in our homes. That can happen in our relationships. But it's dependent upon how we relate to God and how we communicate with one another. May what we say and do be pleasing in the Lord's eyes and as well. Be encouraging and helpful to one another. Let's not put burdens on others, but let's actually help to lift off the burdens of others. And we can all be reminded that burdens are lifted at Calvary. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we give thanks to you for all that you've blessed us with. We thank you for the reconciliation that you've brought about in our own hearts and lives through Jesus Christ. That even him, he became a burden bearer when he took our sins and bore them in his own body. Because of what Christ has done for us, we know that we've been reconciled to you, O oh God. Teach us to live in the light of what you've done for us from day to day. And that we would be as your ambassadors seeking to reconcile people to yourself. Give us opportunities even this week that by your grace and in your power we may carry someone else's burden for your glory and honor to encourage others to have words that build up and not tear down. To have actions that do likewise. <coughs> Thank you for each one here. Thank you for their attentiveness. Thank you for the way in which each one does encourage. And the body of Christ is strengthened by the presence of each one serving you, Lord, and serving one another. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.